Nathan here. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Nate Parsons, and I'm one of the co-founders of Parsons TKO. And I am joined today um, by a um, fantastic expert uh, joining us from the uh, Enterprise Community Partners, David Edwards, their CIO. And uh, I'll also be um, getting a little help today from uh, my, my coworker, John. So I don't know, uh, John, if you want to take it away. Sure. It's nice to meet everyone. I'm John Harrison, Solutions Producer at Parsons TKO. We're here to really talk about uh, three general topics today, um, post-pandemic technology investments, um, team convergence and the new hybrid reality that we find ourselves in these days, and all the change management that that entails. So essentially, we want to look at uh, some organizations that built in resiliency and remote work capability before the pandemic and how they fared much better during the pandemic than those that sort of scrambled to catch up, which is one of the reasons why I invited a former colleague, David, to, to be a part of this conversation. And we wanna talk about what's next. You know, Now that we've moved along the continuum from pandemic to post-pandemic or arguably post-pandemic, we'd like to take a look back at some of the strategies and tactics that uh, IT executives, IT leaders um, have used, also marketing leaders, if there's other folks on the team uh, joining, fundraising, that type of thing. Things that uh, have been done to sort of keep uh, mission-driven organizations afloat and at times flourishing you know, during these challenging times that we've been through. We also want to talk about how technology has enabled that, but also look at how we adjust to this new challenge of hybrid work. So we know from the data that many employees are hesitant to return to a physical office, but there's also a disconnect between what employees want and what some of the executives want. So we're seeing that a partial return to the office is likely for many. Um, what does that partial return mean for those tools and processes that we all got comfortable using and navigating during the pandemic? And we want to also think about how this impacts the future of things like video conferencing, collaboration with internal employees, but also your internal stakeholders, your constituents, your marketing teams, your sales teams, how you manage events, how you're managing webinars. So really, this is largely a conversation about change management and how successful leaders choose to invest in certain tools and how they bring folks on board. Um, and also how they communicate those changes and how they impact uh, things that are near neighbor to their work and how they create catalysts for change and build resilience, which is a big, big important part of this. So with that, um, I want to uh, ask Nate first, you know, give us a little bit of professional background, your area of expertise and how, what drew you to be interested in organizational change and change management? And also, what's your relationship to technology strategy and investment? And then I'll ask the same question to David. So Nate, why don't we start with you? Okay, great, thanks. Those are some, some lovely questions. Um, so just a little bit of background about me. Um, I started my uh, career as a software developer and I was a developer for 10 years doing all sorts of various things, kind of um, you know, starting out doing um, uh, web applications, um, you know, things like uh, virtual uh, student unions for colleges, things like that. And then eventually uh, moving into sort of large scale um, enterprise web development for clients like the United Nations or the um, U.S. House of Representatives, um, you know, really large scale implementations, things like that. And um, as I kind of got uh, two through 10 years, I kind of wanted to switch it up a little bit. And so I switched over to the user experience side of the house because I'd always been interested in that part of things. And I did that for four or five years. And, you know, that sort of became a unique skill set, having a sort of, um, you know, large scale enterprise engineering background mixed with sort of a user experience mindset. And one of the through lines through that, um, you know, uh, career was that whenever these technology projects that I worked on were delivered, there was a variability in the use and the uptake of these systems, you know, like a brand new project completed, and it might be a successful project and then it deployed something, but did it actually change how the business worked? Was there like value return where, you know, did people change the way they worked to use the new capabilities they've been given? And a lot of times the answer to that was uneven or no, you know, and that led me to be really interested in this, you know, sort of theory of change. Um, how do organizations actually 
evolve, not just, you know, acquire, because I think there's uh, often a sense that if you buy technology, now you have the capability. We're really, you know, it's people, it's process, it's strategy, it's, you know, uh, adoption, it's, you know, uh, configuration in small, tiny ways that remove frictional elements that make people's days better and the tool more enjoyable to use. And all that got me really interested in this idea of, you know, how do we actually empower people with technology, not just sort of deliver it to them. Um, you know, that's part of why we, you know, have things like, a, you know, a professional networking group on LinkedIn so that we can continue to have conversations around that in an informal way and let people kind of work on those sort of issues. Um, but anyway, that's sort of my background and how I got into these things and how it relates now to things like, you know, strategy and budgeting is that I'm often consulting for organizations in the nonprofit and mission driven space about how they spend their money most effectively and how they uh, handle long term planning. You know, I think that one of the things that's challenging um, for all tech organizations, but especially for smaller uh, nonprofits and folks who are using technology, but don't consider themselves a technology organization is the um, you know, life cycle planning of tools, you know, how do they add something to their toolkit? How do they remove it? How do they pick something, understanding the turnover there is, they're going to have as an organization? All those sort of pieces of the puzzle need to be sorted out. And that's something that we try and help organizations um, do a better job with and sort of have more expertise to bring to bear on those problems. So uh, that's a long-winded answer about how I got here, but uh, hopefully illuminating. And uh, yeah, I'll hand it back to you too, John. Sure. And David would love some, uh, you know, some, some, uh, intros from you about like what got you interested in change management was it out of necessity was uh you know and yeah. I, I i i would say i will at least i started my career i'm a i'm a network engineer by trade so i'm the opposite of me i started my life in data centers and and uh you know working in in hardware um and you know honestly you know throughout my career what i what i found is, is very similar to nate um, I was in the business um, of delivering technology, right? That was the goal, right? You, you need a, a new building, you need a new data center built, all of those great things. Here's the capability, it is delivered. Um, what I found, and you know, this is a, a, along with the, the way that the, you know, the industry has matured itself, was you know, I would deliver technology, say <clears throat> a remote, uh, say a remote access um, technology, a VPN to, to a group of end users. And so I, I, I provided it to them. And then they would say, well, we really wish it did this, or, you know, how do you do this when you're in, um, in an airport? Or how do you, do, you know, so I you really started to see that it was going, and this is as early as like 2008, 2009, that it really was going to you couldn't just drop off a technology at, at a customer's door and expect them to just take it, <laughs> right? Like here it is. Uh, you know, the, the consumer technologies were moving just as was move, were moving faster than we were, right? In, in corporate technology, and you know they were beginning to want similar treatments, tr similar support that they 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 saw on the consumer side. So that really led to. You know a lot of the things that I that I that I do now, and, and, I'll, and I'll let you you know let us get kind of get, get further into the talking about it. But um, I, I spent my career starting out as a technology deliverer to um, to kind of transforming into the uh, solutions provider uh, to the you know almost almost the uh, fixer, <laughs> right? So there's technologies and. Our, 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 we, we have lack of adoption and we have lack of, uh, lack of um, you know, capitalizing on our investments, right? Which is one of the, the worst things that you can happen is you spend a bunch of money, you go through a bunch of change and you lack adoption <laughs> and, you, and you lack uh, true, true, um, true real return on investment, right? So uh, throughout my career, I've moved from, you know, from being a network engineer to uh, through management of various, various levels and really the ability to do the things, uh, do, to do change management is the name of the game, right? Yeah. To be able to, do, and that's the big change management, not just uh, with, with customers, but with executives, with, you know, with boards and also specifically with your own team, right? Because that is actually the other, the other piece. So I've, I've, been in, I've been in IT since I was uh, 19 years old. So uh, probably 20 something years. Um, and throughout, you've seen that change in the demand for more change management, 
um, from 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 what was what used to be simply a utility, right? It was like you turn the lights on, you have internet, you know. So, yeah, I have a I have a great story. Um, uh, David and I were colleagues at a at a big nonprofit for a couple of years, but going back way before that, this is back in 2012, October of 2012 to be specific. Um, the the guy that hired David came into my office and I had just started working at this nonprofit um, literally a month before. And uh, he was really concerned about something. And I was responsible at the time for the, the company's intranet. We called it ENET at the time. And I was responsible for the company's website. So the internal communications, the external communications were really important. And this was a pretty fast growing nonprofit. I think, you know, at that time there were maybe 350, 400 employees, but we were hiring fast and furiously and, and acquiring other nonprofits while this was going on. And the, uh, the, the then IT leader sat down with me and said, I'm really concerned because Superstorm Sandy is heading up the coast um, to our New York office. And we moved all of our servers from the roof to the basement after 9-11, mm -hmm. you know, that was the big thing back then was like, you know, we got to get the servers, on-premise servers down to the basement. And I just have a really bad feeling about this. And we talked about um, how he had directory controllers like in the basement so that people could log into their computers. We talked about how only 25% of the staff had laptops at the time. They only had a few SaaS applications. So there was like Salesforce and maybe maybe we were using SharePoint on a limited scale. Um, but, you know, I think he realized this is something that's going to happen like often. And it did, you know, the next day, the server room was literally underwater. And, you know, we, we scrambled to get folks home. We scrambled to get messages to them, you know, because they couldn't. They couldn't get to our internet unless they were sitting physically in the office logged into mm -hmm. their computers, you know, so getting messages to them, you know, it's like, should we put these messages on our public website for our employees, you know, it was, it was a big scramble. And I think, you know, this, this IT leader was definitely a visionary and he hired a great guy, David, of course, but David came in and, you know, he came into a situation before the pandemic, you know, this is two years before the pandemic, give or take. And I just remember um, we had gotten to the point at this nonprofit where everybody was using every, every tool. It was a smorgasbord of software, right? It was like a litany of legacy applications. Right. Um, you know, and I think it was, it, it had good intentions. You know, there were, it was, it was give everybody the tools that they need to do their job and they'll pick the right tool and so on. David, you came on board and, you know, one of the first things you did is I, <laughs> I think you said, there's a lot of things going on. We need to simplify this, right? And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the processes and strategies and tactics that you went through going from what you inherited to really getting to that point in March of 2020, when the World Health Organization mm -hmm. said, we got a global pandemic on our hands and immediately, the company we worked for shifted the entire workforce within a week, you know, at a, in a nonprofit um, to distributed remote work. You know, what what happened between that period of time, between the time you started and where we landed right before the pandemic? And what were some of the stories you can tell us about how you brought people along with the change that you kind of brought to the organization at that point in time? Right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. Um... It's a long story, but I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, so, so when I came in, in, in this, you know, it's, it's it's something that I have been able to repeat, um, and through some failures, right, figured out how to, the best way to do it, uh, at least a one a way that works for me. But um, you know, the, the very first thing I did when I when I joined that organization was um, I actually met with like fifty six business leaders. You know, that was the very first thing I did, um, and I, I kind of have a very is a very simple process for like for changing things and one of the, the very first thing is trust right so I, the first thing i wanted to do was say hey i'm the new guy in town i'm here to help i'm not from the government and i'm here to help but i'm here to help you um and i, I and try to build some relationships and just get to know who was who right um in in, the, in that organization 
But I, I would say that the, the very first thing I did was assess the, the, the catalog of tools that we had, right? And I, although I, you know, I would say that it is, it is great to allow people to make uh, decisions on what tool they would like to use, you cannot abdicate the responsibility that you are literally the expert and that is what they are paying you for, right? So yes, they will pick a tool because they have to get their job done, but that is your job, right? So I, um, I like, there, there's kind of two things that I brought it up in, in the intro that you need to do, right? So you, you have to have, you have to build that trust. And that is with your business, your consumers, your customers, and it's with your team. And in that particular role, I was new, right? I'm the new leader. I have a new team. I'm trying to assess them. I'm trying to assess the tools and I'm trying to assess my, my new customers, right? Um, and so what I did is I, I did that. I went through and I, I did some business interviews with, uh, with my stakeholders. I it was assessing my team and I was assessing our tools and I'm literally looking through these tools and there's so much redundancy um, I go to look with my team and they're like, yes, we know how to, to, to run three out of the seven and we know some of this and oh, that is only run by this department and, they, and we don't really run it. You know, it's not ours. You know, all of those, those good things, they bought that by themselves, all kinds of crazy stuff like that, right? Um, so what, what I like to do is I do, I want to make it simple, right? But you, when, when you're doing that, you're coming up with a solution that involves you know, the pain points that you've heard from your customers, along with what your team can truly support, along with your knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the first thing I did after I did the assessment was sort of mirror back uh, to uh, two of my customers, like what they've been saying and to my team, because you need, it's, it's crazy with change management, you think that you're, you're, you're changing the, the business, but you're also, your team needs to buy in. Like that's the, like, you can't have people kind of detracting from the, the new strategy that you want to implement, right? So you got to get those guys on board, guys and gals on board um, uh, first and foremost, so that they're along with your, with, with, with what you want to do. So I basically did the assessment, had a huge catalog of things, talked to the team about what they know how to do, what they don't, what do they think about some of the technologies? One of those were an old Cisco system that was 12 years old and was out of warranty and we could barely support. We had to rely on third party, uh, third party vendors to try to support and it cost us a lot of money, right? So um, it, allowed, it allowed us to, to basically really narrow in on some of the, the real issues that people were having. They could not communicate with each other well. They didn't know which system that um, any other department may be on at any given time, right? Um, so we really started to hone in on, we need a unified communication strategy, number one. But there were pieces underneath that we had to implement in order to, um, in order to enable it. We needed better connectivity at all of our offices, right? We needed to, you know, basically get rid, rid of the reliance on our, our main office, which was the Columbia Data Center, our Columbia headquarters. Um, and its servers and all that other good stuff, because it was truly hindering the way that people needed to be mobile, especially as our you know, mission-based nonprofit, where are spread across the U.S., there's people traveling all the time, they can't get to the internal resources when they go to certain places, they don't know what the Wi-Fi is when you go from one office to the other, you know, all of those, those blocking and tackling things also need to be, um, need to be improved. So basically, I take all of that, those inputs and you now have to obviously get um, get buy-in from the you know your operating committee, your executive level, right? And it, when you come, when you get when you get there, you really need to be speaking their language, right? So I am all I am all about building the business case, writing my memo, getting my return on investment, because that's the language that they speak in, right? Of, Look, if I do this, in fact, um, us moving to specifically going to Zoom saved us like $1.4 million over three years, right? And you wouldn't think it would because it, by, by, by its nature, that subscription model usually means that you're going to spend more money. But when we calculated all of the different pieces of that change, including the, the software, you know, the, the WebEx, the GoToMeeting, the Citrix, um, the internet circuits that were gonna be combined, um, that hadn't been re renegotiated in 10 years, all of that together, equals a savings, 
that you're, you're going to get the green light from your CFOs, the CEOs with that. And you're taking that fact that the users are also complain, complaining about it. And you combine that last part with this, we're going to pick a solution that your team, your, your technology team can support. Everybody is at that point, everybody's good. You know, it's going to get, you know, to get more rough once you start implementation. But at that point, you, you really listen to your stakeholders, your internal and external stakeholders, and you made your business case. So you're, 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 we were in a really good place, probably by the uh, fall of uh, 2019. So fall of 2019, we've done all of this assessment. We told, you know, we've got our business case together. We, uh, we both, we both, um, uh, and I want to take one step back. The whole time while, while you're doing that assessment, you are responding with when, when users are complaining about specific technologies and what isn't working, what isn't working, you're responding with, yes, we have this unified communication plan and program. We will be resolving these issues, right? Because that is the other piece to get people to come with, right? Um, so the whole time, and, and John, you know, I'm sending out messages. Here's a technology update on, you know, December 1st, we will be getting rid of the blue jeans. <laughs> and I'm telling them what's going away and the new solution. We will be moving to a, a Zoom meeting and Teams for chat, blah, 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 blah. The whole time you're you're keeping that message and that, that, that communication open. And you're also, and here's a big, big piece. Um, you're going to have uh, detractors. People are going to say that they love X, right? You have to listen to them. Like you have no choice. Uh, and it, not only, you don't, like you don't have, you're not gonna change your strategy necessarily, but you have to listen to them, right? And I think that's, that's one of the things uh, that I learned you know, through the years is um, when you're just delivering software, you almost tune them out. Right, you're look. We got to take the meat. We're going to push through, but the whole time you have to listen to it because you're trying to build that trust. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece that we did along the way was we uh, we had an education plan also. Right. So as we started building the program, we we had education on two fronts. We had the internal team who's going to deploy education. You know how to run these new tools that we want to put in, and then we had the end user education. Meaning, one, we said, hey, this thing is coming. Here's why it's coming. You know, I literally had you know, webinars with the end users. Look, this thing is coming. This is why we've heard, we've li listened to you. We sent out surveys. All of those, that program was, was set up. Um, and then the, the, the last piece is we also had um, end user involvement. So yeah. we made people stakeholders in this change. Like you, uh, finance person, will be the person who advocates for our stuff. So yeah. um, by the time we got to um, basically January, so we, we deployed Zoom meeting in, uh, in the fall of 2019. Mm -hmm. By January of 2020, we had deployed uh, Zoom phone. Um, and and we and it was uh, it was a dynamic shift, I will say, for most because we told them we were getting rid of the big piece of green plastic that was sitting on their desk um, that they must have, and it was a, it was a, quite a bit of, of uproar. But at the same time, uh, it, 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 when I say you can't advocate it, you have to look. You know what the if you know what the right solution is. The, no one else, the, the, you know, the, the developer, the, the, loan, the, the uh, loan origination folks, that's not their, their job. They really need someone to deliver them the right solution for them who has listened to them. So, yeah. uh, you know, I would say that the, the big change management is, is all about the, you know, it's all about trust, education, and involvement. Like if you can do that, you're you in repeat, you know, rinse and repeat, <laughs> right? Yeah. You you will be you'll be in a good place because you told you listened to them and you responded with with the, the right thing. And, it, and luckily, I mean, it was no, there was no uh, obviously no foresight into that. You know, and two months later we would have a, a pandemic. But by the time we we got to um, by the time we got to March, we had already upgraded all the internet at every office. We had already deployed virtual phones and all the phone numbers were already moved to all 1,100 employees. Um, and we had already um, deployed Zoom meeting and they had been on Zoom meeting for like four months already. So we had already retired the old systems. Um, and which is, which is a win for the team. It's a win for the IT budget because obviously we were able to cut costs doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, 
the the rest was history because you're rolling in and and you know it was a very very um, seamless you know role to to remote. But honestly, the way I feel about it, and this this is this is very true, is that most of those things are usually under invested in. Usually, it's very hard to, to say that you want to spend a bunch of money on a phone system. You know, yeah. you you cannot sell it that way. Um, it has to be sold like I'm listening to your problems. This is a fix for your problem, not the old phone system is really old. It's out of warranty. I want two million dollars to replace it. That's not the that's not the spiel, right? The spiel is you have pain points. Your your corporate office has gone down twice in the last two months. Here's the res, here's the resolution, and it'll save you money. Yeah, win, right? So that that's a long story. Uh, it's really condensed <laughs> to a to, uh, to uh, you know uh, uh, fifteen minutes. You, I mean, you also did a you also did a pretty fantastic job of identifying like the units of time that your team was spending on supporting like this Absolutely. legacy system, you know, and Absolutely. like those 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 old green Cisco phones, you know, they're, you know, your team would 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 work over the weekends to run patches on that system and yes, support them and move yes, phones and everything. And right. if if you had gone into the pandemic with those desk phones as a still sitting on the desk in use, it would have been much tougher. Oh you know, yeah, so. I, I, I'm sure. I well, I, I have from experience. I know I've, I've supported the remote Cisco phone at someone's house at someone's home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that you don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's you, hard work. It's hard work. Um, and I want to point point out another thing that I think made made this successful is just the you allowed everyone, all the staff, to participate in the change. Like you let us pick our own headsets. Yep. You know, you offered yep. plenty of training and adoption like mm -hmm. um, opportunities. You know, for entire departments to basically come how to learn how to make the most of this new situation oh, yeah. new situation Absolutely. and yeah. Yeah. every one of those was a, was a success you know and it also got people involved and yeah. i can pick my own headset this is yeah. going to be it, fine we, you yeah. know we, so. had, we had tech days right we had tech days where we were showing them the new things that were coming that were coming you know yeah. it, it you know honestly it, it's it, it's um it's outside of my personality to do that but you you have to know that you, if the, the you want to give as many opportunities as possible, you know that for people to to come to adjust to the changes coming, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is no there is I mean honestly to, to be extremely transparent as John knows I am, your career is tied to it, right? So the outcome of this is tied to it. Give them as much uh, opportunity as possible. Um, because you you know what, and I and I have stories of, of when this didn't go this well, right? But um, you know, we we did. It's a small concession to give someone a headset, you know, that you know, anywhere from you know, I have the uh, and I have one right next to me. I have the the fifteen twenty dollar headset to the you know the 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 three hundred dollar headset, right. right? It's but it's a small concession in the long run. When you when that will get them to adopt the, the new technology, right? Yeah. You can't have the green headset, but you can get up and walk anywhere you want now, <laughs> right? Um, it, it, you know, it, and we actually went as far, John, to um, actually run the stats of how often people were using their desk phones. Yeah. You know? um, and it, it, you know, this, this, because we know that these things will come up. How, hey, I use my desk phone every day. Well, technically you use it three times in two weeks. But, you know, you, you want to get that data because you want to come from a place, obviously, as a technical person, I, you know, I live off data, but that isn't quite the same as every other, you know, business. They run off their data, right? So, yes, but the three calls I have are super important, right? Um, where I can guarantee, like, not only will you be able to take that call on a desk phone, but you'll be able to take it on your cell phone, you'll be able to take it on your laptop, um, you, you're completely, you know, that, that number follows you everywhere. And, um, you know, one of the very tactical things that happened there was they all kept their same number, which was a, a yeah. which, you, which you wouldn't think was going to be a crazy thing, but it is like the most important thing in the whole world. Um, yeah. So it, it was, it, and you only learn that by getting the feedback from them. Hey, mm -hmm. I don't get phone calls at all, but do I have to change my signature? Do I have to change my business card? All of these things need to be accounted for. And that's really where I, I want to hit that. You have to listen to the detractors because that's they're telling you what 
what they're worried about. They're telling you their anxieties and you need to be able to re-articulate how your solution fits those, right? So you can't do that without listening to them. Um, yeah. And if you don't have those, those tech days, if you don't have all of those education sessions, you will not have the opportunity to hear it because it's so easy in IT to just go back in the back room, work on your stuff, <laughs> right? Turn out the next thing and see if people are using it, right? So um, if you don't allow for those opportunities, it just doesn't work. So um, it, it was, it, we, we definitely, we went over uh, above and beyond what I, what I would consider necessarily necessary, but it, it actually paid out dividends for me. Yep. I wanted to shift um, a little bit to talking about some of the technology investments that uh, people are thinking about, um, some of the strategies for what to invest in. And one of the things we did at Parsons uh, TKO was we put out a poll on LinkedIn. You know, this was just a, a very ad hoc um, to get a sense of what are the organizations, nonprofits and mission driven organizations top technology investment priorities for this year and next. And we did this as a LinkedIn poll, and I'm going to share my screen so you can see the results and take a look at this. And it's probably no surprise. I'll let you take a look at this. You all see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm curious, like, um, and I'll ask, you know, I'll pivot to Nate here for a second. Like, what do you think this means? Like, what? Uh, we're obviously in a new area where things are happening both asynchronously, in person, distributed, distributed, remote, and so on. Um, what do you think this means? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, I think it, it means a couple of things. So, you know, some percentage of those answers are related to people experiencing friction in their job, you know, various sorts, you know, and I think that you know, friction is one of the drivers of technology investment in organizations. You know, when people are unhappy or they're hearing a lot of complaints or executives feel like their team is distracted, like priorities and money tends to shift to address those. But I also think it, there's another piece of this, which is more positive, which is I think there's a lot of people who've learned to work in new ways they really enjoy. I mean, you know, there are some percentage of people who like working in the office and leaving home, but there's a lot of people who like working from home and having the flexibility and have managing their kids and all those sorts of things. And so I think it's also a positive side that organizations are realizing there are new ways to work. And, you know, one of the challenges is that if you're an organization, you're now in an evolutionary space if you're trying a new way to work. You know, you don't have necessarily historic patterns that you can draw upon. And, you know, one of the challenges here is that means there's often some experimentation. And I think that's some um, can be challenging in the IT or the, the technology world in particular, where people kind of want it to be like going to like Home Depot and buying a fridge or something where they come home and install it and it works. But it's a lot more like trying to build a, a, a dishwasher out of parts, you know, and you might get it right, you might not, you know, you might realize you need a place for pans and you didn't build that in, you know. And so I think that's part of this as well is that, you know, people are sort of struggling a little bit on terms of what that future work will look like. And a simple example is having a meeting in a conference room where half the people are remote, you know, where in historic times, um, there was a huge bias towards people in the office. Like you might throw it to someone on the phone once in a while, but those people would really have to work hard to like get their ideas heard and be involved. And there's a real priority on sort of physical presence. I think a lot of organizations, you know, are sort of aware of that on some level. And, you know, they're kind of wondering how can we prevent that? And I think the hybrid workspaces investment is kind of a big piece of that, which is that it's actually really challenging um, to run a hybrid meeting. And I think people who have done it well have, unique skill sets that they have learned to do that and processes and they can be repeated, but they're not things that you organically know how to do. And they're not the same skills that you would use to run a purely in-person meeting in terms of facilitation and moderation and proctoring. And frankly, there's just a lot of technology challenges like, hey, somebody drew something on the whiteboard. How do you share that with somebody remote when even pointing a camera at the whiteboard? It's going to be really blurry and hard to read, you know, and who's going to do it? And is it going to be disruptive for the people in the, in the meeting itself physically? So I, I do think this is just a, a sort of brave new world a little bit where people are really starting to embrace this, but there's, you know, frankly, tiny amounts of expertise that we see in industry about running successful hybrid meetings or hybrid workspaces. So I, I think that's part of it. Yeah. David, what are your thoughts about this? Are there, are there any like uh, things that you're seeing from your vantage point, like uh, 
data that you're looking at or strategies or anything like that on what to invest in when it comes down to like that hybrid concept? Yeah, I, definitely. I, I think all of us have, have gotten a push for, you know, hot desk and hoteling softwares. Uh, the remote, uh, the ability to work at hybrid workspace, I, I would take a little bit of experience from working in like global organizations, which people were just not in the same place anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So that we just had to figure it out, but like technology, like meat boards and things like that. So you can actually write on something physical um, and mm -hmm. still uh, and still have a sense of Zoom or Teams, et cetera. They actually make a really small device. Uh, and I, I, I can't recall if it's a meat, it was from meat. Um, but I'll, I'll send it to you in the notes, but it actually, you attach it to a regular whiteboard and it copies it and sends the, the video to the, uh, to the, to the, um, to the Zoom or our teams. But it's those type of technologies are definitely it. We were looking at, um, it for, you know, for our space, uh, facilities management tools, um, mm -hmm. you know, building, being able to figure out where someone is, if they were truly in the office. For all of those contact tracing reasons, the fact that you, you know, a lot of, you know, the vaccine mandates and things like that are being required. So, you know, the biggest ask of us are, how do we do hybrid, you know, hybrid spaces? How do we know when people are in the office? I need technology for that. How do I know how much space is being utilized? So the facilities management side, like, hey, we have, you know, for us, it's the second largest spend that we have, right? Yeah. Is our office space, are we using all of it? Are we going to be using all of it? Right. Um, you know, and you can't get that without any good data. Right. You just can't, you know, you send a poll and everybody says, yeah, I want my cube. <laughs> right. Just in <laughs> case I come back to it. Right. But um, but you, we, we need real data. So that's what we've been be being asked for. So we've been looking at the, you know, tools like uh, Robin Power, which is like a, a hot desk and hotels tool, um, looking at, you know, service now, you know, facilities management monitor, I think it called something else now, um, looking at like, eye office, things like that to be able to give more visibility into how we're using our facilities and also really um, how we are enabling these uh, the return to office. So we've been, re, uh, re, we've been rebuilding our conference rooms to be all Zoom rooms, to, to have the capability to have, you know, multiple people speaking at, at, uh, very quickly, which in Zoom nowadays, like we basically speak one at a time, which you, you don't really notice it, but um, if you know, if, if you can tell by the, the amount I talk, if you don't talk, you might not get a word in. So, you know, the, the, the way that we work in Zoom is different than we work in a room. Um, so so I, that's what really where we've been focused on, facilities management. And I really think that that's what, when, when they say tools for remote spaces and hybrid spaces, that's what they're speaking of. Um, how are we utilizing these spaces? How can they still be utilized in this new, uh, new normal? Yeah. That's, that's super interesting. I was curious too, like, um, just thinking about how the pandemic has forced so many people to become technology experts in a way, in a sense, you know, and just get comfortable with new things that they weren't comfortable with. Um, we've, in our work, we've seen some convergence of teams, like where technology and marketing and fundraising and different teams across organizations, like the lines get really blurred there, right? Like the, the technology team is, is helping the marketing team perhaps, and maybe there's a MarTech component that's shared across multiple yeah. disciplines perhaps. We've, I know that at Enterprise, like the communications and the marketing team have combined or with fundraising. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, like if, um, and this is a question, this could be for Nate or David, like what, what are you all seeing as far as like trends go along these lines with um, teams having to work together in new ways, like, and sort of using this technology to, to get to a better position in, in, in their offerings and in in delivering the mission to their constituents? Yeah, I mean, I'll dive in, but there's that. I'm sure David has lots of great things to say about this too. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that we see is that there's a real convergence of uh, the ways that people work that's been happening for 10 or 15 years, you know, where, you know, the tools, the digital tools that people use to, to collaborate, to design, to, to share things, regardless of the, the departmental function are becoming more and more similar. And, you know, especially where we focus in terms of like audience engagement and outreach, things like 
who is a person and how do we interact with them are, you know, sort of ubiquitous from the development team doing fundraising to the, you know, marketing team meeting people for the first time to even the executive team wanting to have one-on-ones with important people in their peer group or their community or their sphere of influence, things like that. And so, you know, just the taking like contacts as an example, you know, most organizations have at least one CRM, but sometimes more than one CRM, you know, depending on, you know, which part of the organization started to think about contacts first, often it's simultaneous. They often have different outreach tools like email tools and things they're using to communicate with them. Some of them have social listening tools to like listen to the community more widely. You know, other groups have things like donor matching databases or potential high net worth individual matching databases where they're finding contacts from one system and matching them against this list to see if they're worth, you know, investigating for, you know, potential financial support, things like that. Um, you know, but in essence, what it really means is that collaboration between departments is more and more important and more valuable. And, you know, the role of the, you know, IT team is to sort of provide a little bit of expertise on how to plug things in across departments. And, you know, that's especially important when the IT team doesn't want to actually manage the thing directly, you know, which is often the case in terms of like CRMs, outreach tools, things like that, you know, really want the experts to be using them in expert ways within those departments, but you don't want it to stovepipe the organization or prevent the organization from getting value from that expertise in another area. And so, you know, to go real nerdy here, like, you know, a lot of what we do with like our fractional CTO, CIO support is help people with these thorny problems with things like data contracting and how do you have governance between teams? How do you just name the fields? Um, how do you pick tools that are more easy to support those connections with? Because, you know, honestly, there's often tools that are similar enough that the department would be happy if they went A route or B route, right? But from a technologist perspective, you know that if they went this route, you'd have a low cost, reliable connection between two systems. And if you went this other route, you'd mm -hmm. have a very dubious, handmade, hand supported mm -hmm. selection, you know, connection between these systems. And that's really where the expertise of like, you know, David is missing in a lot of organizations we work with, right? Which is no one's really minding the store from that perspective. And a lot of what we're trying to do um, with that sort of collaboration isn't to like help people do their particular job better. It's to help people in the halo around them do their jobs better by having access and collaboration around the same content data, you know, um, you know, whatever that piece of the puzzle is. So I'll hand it over to Dave, but that's kind of my, 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 my high level view of it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, you, you hit the, the big points. I mean, the, the, one of the reasons why, you know, like we said, you can't advocate the responsibility we definitely don't want to run reports for people. We don't want to run your CRM for you. But um, one of the things that I, and I'm always, I'm always for, this is just my, my advice, is that the person who has the, the, the whoever has the dollars owns, owns the, the, the outcome, right? So yes, I, I think that one, we want the end, use, the end user in the business to run their business and their tools as much as possible. But when it comes to that architecture, to be a little geeky, you the whole reason for having the simplified portfolio is so that you can get things like um, you know holistic security and understanding how that's, that works, how, how, how you manage the data and the privacy, how do you get uh, scalability out of all this data that you're collecting and the ability to look across it, right? Because you actually don't know if you don't run the tool and someone just picked the tool. So when you, when I, I because we, you know, in, in my situation, we own all technology spend so that we actually pay for it. They'll come to us looking for, with a, if, if this is, this is requires a lot of work. They'll come to you hopefully with their problem and not what tool they want, right? So they come to you with the business problem. And then you can say, yes, out of A and B, and it's fine if they have a, a, a suggested tool, right? But they can come to your Airbnb. You can say, hey, these are the things I already have. These are the things that you, you, you want to have. I think you should pick B. B does all the security things. It will allow us to integrate into our current tool set. We keep the data. We can share that data with the other systems that we have. No one knows that but you, right? So, so like they, the, everyone else has a shared service and technology. You see everyone's ask. And you have to build that platform for them all to run them, right? Um, so I totally agree. That's literally the reason why you want it simple. You want it simple and you want it, them to direct back to you just so that you can ensure that these things happen, right? Um, or later on, four years later, somebody will say, hey, I really wish I had data on X. This CRM was created and they never talked to each other, right? Uh, and who's going to pay to integrate them now, 
right? Those type of things, which, yeah, the two CRM thing is something I've seen like eight times over. I don't know why it keeps happening, but it does. Um, it, it's usually some department's budget is bigger than another. And to your point, somebody is more mature than the other one, right? So, hey, I just need something real quick to catch a couple contacts for volunteers. And then that, next thing you know, they have a thousand volunteers in there trying to figure out what's going on. So uh, I totally, I totally agree with, with Nate. That is the reason why you want to make sure that you can, that they go to you, that you can give them that kind of art, architecture's um, perspective um, and ensure that it works with the rest. Because the next app and the next ask will be something that's almost 80% the same, right? It's literally the same ask. And if you could just, and if, and uh, so this is uh, one other piece I will add to it. One of the reasons why I'm always a big advocate for a, a service catalog or a portal is just so that people can see this one, the services you provide, but also the tools that you have already, right? Because that's, and John will know this, you'll, you, it's, it's almost like you got to find out by, from a guy that you know that, you know, like there's, it's almost a, a thing you search around that in environment to figure out like, what's our project manager tool? Does anybody have this thing, you know? Uh, and if you don't tell them that, they will go out and try to get it themselves because they still need to accomplish their job, right? So that's the other piece I'm always an advocate for is telling people what you're offering. Like, if you ask me for help on finding a facilities management tool, we will do that. We will go and find it. We And um, and kind of getting away from the, the office of the no, right? Like, we just won't help you because, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, right? We, we want to be like, no, please come to us because that will allow us to actually scale these, these investments. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh gosh, that, that's such a good point, Dave. Yeah, I mean, you're inspiring me with all the stuff you're saying because uh, we just ran oh, into yeah. a, a client recently. Yeah, you know. you again, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, there's there's, uh, there's so much so much there. I mean, you know, one of the things that that I think you actually mentioned to me another day we were talking was that um, you know, when there's there's you know this this concept in in you know uh, technology management of like shadow tech or banded technology where somebody has kind of self-installed something or bought something mm -hmm. or started to use something to meet a need, but they kind of did it on their own. They didn't really coordinate with anybody. Right. And then it's discovered by other people in the organization that they're doing it, right? You're like, right. oh, I didn't know you were doing that. That's right. really interesting. Um, anyway, you know, you, you were saying that that often is a, a map to the services that you might want to offer or that you, right. people don't know that you're offering. And I think it kind of right. just reinforces your point about, you know, good communication. But, you know, we ran into one organization that had a very extreme version of that where, you know, they had a, an overtaxed, uh, you know, internal support team, and they had decided they were just going to, you know, prevent things like, you know, phishing attacks and spam and all these other things by just locking their Outlook email client down to the nines, right? And so it was like totally impregnable, they thought, you know, mm -hmm. but they weren't really communicating with their, their teams. And it turns out another team decided this was too restrictive. They're having too many problems. And so they decided to completely replace, uh, you know, that with uh, <laughs> a Google app suite, you know, and they started using yeah. Gmail and the email addresses weren't even the organizational email because of course they oh couldn't like gosh. get tied yeah. into the domain names mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And you know, you know, the IS team was kind of pulling their, their hair out, you know, they're like, oh my God, yeah. what's going on? But it was all kind of related to this problem of they didn't have credibility as a good partner to configure and work with those things. The team right. didn't really know they could come to work with them in that way. And the tool they were giving them wasn't fitting their need. And, you know, to your point, they had the budget, they could just go and do it. And so, do it, right. and, and, you know, and once that stuff gets installed, that, that particular kind of thing is real insidious, right? Like it's real tough to remove someone's email right. address you've been collaborating with somebody for a year with. And so, yeah, I just think there's a ton of value in, in you know, being a good communicator, <laughs> like you're saying. Yeah, yeah well, the thing is, yeah, I mean, just imagine it. And I can understand, like, there, you know, you have some security issue, you know, uh, you know, one of the one of the IT leaders reacts, you know, adversely, starts tightening all the stuff down. You don't tell anyone. And next thing you know, like, hey, I'm not getting my 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 partner emails anymore or mm -hmm. some newsletter. You know, John knows all about it. Like, no, I'm not getting my newsletter anymore. What's going on here? Right. Uh, and before you know it, look, I have to get it. Let me give them my personal Gmail uh, email, you know. Yeah. Um, but, oh, my gosh. It just, that's just so painful <laughs> once it starts. <laughs> but uh, the shadow IT is, is a real thing. I, I would actually, you know, I would actually, you know, think that I would actually say that is the. Um, you know, to, to use a, uh, you know, a pronoun, that's like the IT guy, right? Like you're going to say no, and you don't listen to anyone and you're going to do what you want. Right. Um, and so they don't, you're not a partner, you know, and that's a big thing for, for us, especially the larger we, we become and more complex is that whole business relationship management and providing someone to go to, 
for them to talk about the change that they need, the problems that they're having, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, they will go do it themselves. It's 2021, you just need a card. <laughs> they can get yeah, anything yeah. they want. Now you're, you know, unfortunately you and the, the chief legal officer will now have to deal with the fact that your data is anywhere, you know, and, 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 and it's out there, but it, that's a symptom. This is something that you've been too restrictive. You're, you haven't, you're, you're, you're too restrictive, not even technology wise, but you're not, you're not listening to your, your, your user base, you know, period. Like if they don't feel like they can trust you or go to you, then there's, you know, you're not really a partner. They could, and you know, I'll, you know, I'll say this in, in all, um, in all reality is that, you know, I when I started, outsourcing was a real thing, and that is a great way to get yourself outsourced. You know, to not listen to your end users. So they, it's it is going to be cheaper to be outsourced. Is it going to be better? It shouldn't be, <laughs> but <laughs> because they are they're going for the the, the mean. You are the, literally. Your job is to be the expert for your business, right? They are the expert for all 100 businesses they, they're, they're supporting, but that is your job. That, that's it. Like if they just want someone to give them laptops, they can go call CDW, they'll drop off laptops. It's not a problem, right? The, that is your job. So you, you, unfortunately, you failed if that happens and you got to recover quickly. You know, you should use it as an example. Hey, this happened. Let's talk about how we can be better partners, you know? Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's a great um, segue to, uh, I know we're running out of time here, so I want to make sure we give enough time to, for Q and A. And also we have a giveaway, which uh, if this was a real conference, we would call it conference swag, but it's actually hybrid swag. I think that's what we'll call it. So let me share my screen and I'll introduce the concept of uh, capacity for change here. So Assessing the capacity for change. So we we do this um, activity as part of our road mapping services. It's a capacity for change workshop. We've done it a few times with uh, several nonprofits of varying sizes, and really it's it's to get like stakeholders, uh, executives, people that are doing production work, people on the technology side, people that are manipulating the data, to really get together and think about you know how much can any organization dedicate to change? And it's, it's, it's a workshop. So we use stickies, we use a, a virtual whiteboard, you know, in the, in the hybrid approach, we use Miro for this now, but you could easily do this in a conference room. You could print this out, um, slap it on a real whiteboard and use real stickies with it. But essentially, you know, what we're trying to answer is how much time, money, and talent can your organization dedicate to change? What are the best times to tackle the change? Like during the year, maybe this is a project that's a two-year project. Maybe it's a six-month project, perhaps. And what are the points of friction and how you can turn them into an opportunity, like what David's been talking about? So these are some concepts that we think leaders need to take into consideration. So we're helping organizations ask, like, how much of yourself can you dedicate to change? So this is very, 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 uh, a very simplified version of the, um, of the uh, capacity for change wall board that we'll, we'll give as a takeaway. But essentially there's little buckets and imagine like, and everyone's in a conference room that could be impacted by a particular project and they're putting down notes, you know, on stickies and sticking them on these different uh, blocks, these different cards to sort of indicate what are some considerations for big and small projects, right? When and how are you going to do it? You know, during the year, is it going to happen at the beginning of the year? Is it going to happen during the summer and so on? How are you going to publicize your change? You know, why are, why are you doing this? You know, there's probably a different message that you want for leadership, for staff, for neighboring departments, and for your constituents and external stakeholders. If you've got donors that could be impacted by something you're changing, you definitely want to communicate that. How are you going to do adoption and training? You know, when, who's going to do it? When is it done? And how is it done? How are you going to collect feedback? You know, so that you can improve the outcome. How often are you going to collect that feedback? What are some lessons learned? You know, from past projects. This is a really fun one. People always know I did this project. It went really well, or it went really poorly, and they can tell you stories about why it went poorly. And what we like to do is find out what made that project go poorly? What stage of the project did it happen in? And what are some things you can institute to make it go better the next time? And then I think one of the most important ones, uh, which we added on with this last client we, we worked with was empathizing with the project uh, impact 
that it's going to have on others, right? This is a really big one. Like, what's in it for them and why should they care, right? So think about that. Like, if you're doing something that's going to significantly change your organization's way of doing business or way of communicating with each other, what do you need to think about? What's in it for them? And I think David talked a lot about, you know, some of the things that he did at Enterprise that really brought people on board. But these are some important considerations. So with that, I know we only have a minute for Q&A, but I wanted to leave leave that open for any Q&A um, and any closing remarks. Yeah, well, if we uh, well, wait, for, wait for questions here, I'll just close out by saying, you know, one of the things that the reasons that we think like that, that kind of process, that change management process is so valuable to do intentionally is that there's so many details in technical projects and there's so much like intricacy. It's really common for these projects to get like stuck in the tree level and nobody's really flying over the forest and being like, hey, there's a cliff over there and there's a nice clearing over to the right, you know, and this process is designed to also bring in people who don't feel like they have technical expertise to the process, which is another really key part of technical projects. There's often a sort of, you know, feeling that the technical experts want to win on their expertise and the people who aren't experts want to like stand back and let them do their thing and have it be a little bit of a black box. And in that gap is often where a lot of the lack of quality delivery happens, you know, and it's not through bad intention, it's really through that gap. And so this process in this um, you know, uh, workshop is kind of designed to help close some of that gap. Yeah, I like, I like right. that. I like that form. That, that form is basically my spiel. So I, I like it a lot. <laughs> I, I didn't realize it looked like that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it's invaluable. Yeah. Well, thank you, David, for joining us. Uh, this has been really thank valuable and, and, and helpful. I hopeful, hope, hope, hopefully to a lot of other uh, nonprofits and mission-driven organizations. So thank you for your time. And thanks everybody for joining. Thank you so much. All right. It was a pleasure, yeah, cheers.